Thank you very much. That was Jochem Le Quantre on the, on the piano and he was playing Beethoven. Uh, as you all know, he was a famous German early romantic composer. Um, romanticism, that's what we'll speak about tonight, uh, amongst other things, amongst uh, literature, uh, Europe, maybe the individual. Um, is there someone coming in? No. <laughs> um, my name is Jante Mosselman. I'm a program editor and I will lead this conversation uh, for you. The program was created by Lola Hart, my colleague. Um, and uh, what we'll do tonight is we'll speak about mainly these two books. Seven Nachten by Simon Strauss. Sieben Nachten in, in German, it was written in German. And uh, De Wette, The Laws, uh, is ook vertaald by Connie Palme. Um, and they have quite a lot in common, I think. Um, and they're both really, really well written. Um, but what I loved most about them is that they're about ideas and they make you think. Um, and when a book does that, uh, what's not to love? So um, we're going to speak about that. You're a very quiet audience. <laughs> <laughs> you can make some noise. Um, am I forgetting something? Yes, we did this program in cooperation with Goethe Institute. Um, and well, you can ask questions uh, at the end of the program. Um, unless there's something really, really urgent. I'm feeling quite tolerant and you're so uh, nice and quiet. So I think we can do that. Um, and the evening is live streamed. So if you have a question, please wait for me to uh, come towards you with the microfo microphone. Um, because otherwise the audience at home, welcome, hello audience at home, uh, won't be uh, uh, able to hear you. And that would be quite a shame. Um, I'm going to start with asking Simon Strauss to join us, please. Simon and give him a applause. <laughs> um, you can sit right next to me. Yes. <laughs> Hello. So Simon, uh, you're a German historian, journalist, author, uh, and this is your first novel, Sieben Nachten. You wrote it in seven days, seven nights, really. Uh, and the Tagespiegel hailed you as one of the greatest talents of a generation, which is quite sure. something. <laughs> so can you start with briefly telling me what your book is about? Um, no, probably not. <laughs> not briefly. It's can you uh, try? It's, uh, it's, uh, it's not a content book. If you want to tell the content, then you will end quite quickly because it's, uh, it's, it's a story about a young man growing up, basically. Mm -hmm. um, nothing really happens more. But this is this is the big adventure to grow up, basically. Um, and um, like you said, it, the, the, it's kind of an experimental um, um, trial to to find out what this is to grow up in seven nights, um, seven nights, seven where under the headlines of the seven sins, mm -hmm. and the and the protagonist is experiencing. Um, in every night, um, a modern or even post postmodern um, expression of the old concept of the sins, mm -hmm. and then uh, he tries to um, to write down what he experienced, what he feels, and in the end, it's uh, yeah, he is not far. It's he, he hasn't really done anything special, but he's just um, uh, become aware of uh, how uh, how difficult it is to to experience and to li to mm -hmm. live. And uh, it was said also that your book is, uh, uh, you're that you are the voice of a generation. Could you tell me what is characteristic uh, for your generation yeah. about this character? Is he is he characteristic for your generation? No, I wouldn't. I mean, although it, it, it's always nice to um, to have this as a slogan, as, a mm -hmm. <laughs> as I would, I would not. Um, I don't. I never had the feeling, and I don't have the feeling that I'm. Um, I, I can speak for a, a whole generation. I mean, what is a generation? That's an mm -hmm. interesting question. You know, if you if you nail it down to the to the birth uh, dates, uh, obviously that's a generation. But sometimes, um, you know, age is not the most important um, definition of who belongs to. What's to more you. important? Um, I would say soul and heart. Um, uh, the, the the question of. Uh, how you feel, basically. And so the book was, I mean, obviously it, it, it talked and it provoked a lot of um, people in my age group, mm -hmm. um, but I also had um, very, very intense and uh, interesting um, um, conversations throughout all year groups, basically. Mm -hmm. Because, I mean, the, the whole question of the book is about growing up, but it's not just growing up in terms of 
age, but in terms of the inner mentality and central structure. So, um, and that doesn't really belong to how old you are on the paper, mm -hmm. but it means how big your heart is, basically. And can you name an example where 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 you see this? Is this what something what people recognized? I mean, the, the whole question of the generation is obviously, I mean, to put it in a, the, the book spoke or provoked, I think, because it's, it's, a, it's an attempt to, uh, to give something against the, the, the postmodern um, decision of, um, of saying, okay, we are done with feeling and we, we are done with the, the question of, um, of reality, basically. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, it, what it tries, and it fails, obviously, but it tries to get into something like a real, uh, um, a real experience, a real feeling again, and and, and it trusts uh, a little bit more than maybe um, other um, other attempts um, in literature um, to to take this seriously. The question mm -hmm. of what does it mean to feel um, in the 21st century, basically, and that is also um, probably um, yeah, that, that was why, you know, the generation, our generation, I mean, the around 30 year olds now, um, they lack a certain degree of experience, I would say. So mm -hmm. they, they haven't really had the historical experiences generations before them um, had. And so they need to, um, to find a new way to, to define um, themselves, basically. And that is the, 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 the moment of time where the book uh, was written. Do you think we're too comfortable? Well, psychologically, probably uh, not not in a political sense, but on the on the on the sense of that we really had the the feeling that we are we are challenged from the inside, basically, mm -hmm. and that we that we really have to um, to to say um, to, to speak out of ourselves and to and to to take seriously what we feel inside. Yes, I think this is. Um, some somehow the deconstructive way basically has uh, has told us that this is not um, important anymore to try to get to the inner um, inner sphere. Anyway, I mean this is really the 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 effect basically the book. Had. When I wrote the book, I didn't think about all of this. <laughs> <laughs> I just thought about um, yeah. I, I just wanted to, in some sense, I, I uh, the book for me was, you know, when you are uh, when you are a small kid, um, you always do like a little line on the on the wall to see how big you are mm -hmm. and, and that changed and this is like the book was this line um, I wanted to draw one one line on the wall to see how I was at a certain stage of my mind now I'm already older <laughs> and, uh, and, and and things have changed obviously mm -hmm. I mean um, but yeah for me it's uh, it's this the line on the wall we're all uh, uh, aging of course and and you described in your book as well that that you have to do this before buying biological products, going on the wellness weekends, thinking about if there's enough baby milk in the fridge, which you was probably maybe describing my life at this uh, <laughs> moment very accurately. Um, but then I was, I was thinking, um, are you in a way trying to capturing, capturing youth? Yeah. Is um, it disappearing? Connie Palm said something very nice at the, uh, over dinner, and we were saying, ah, we don't, um, you know, what is age? We were talking about youth and uh, what is age, and we don't really think about it. And she said, at a certain point, you start thinking about age. You know, it's, it's a very luxury um, not to think about aging. Mm -hmm. For me, I have to say, I always thought about age. When I was young, I always thought about this 30th birthday. For me, it was something, I don't know, m mystical uh, in some sense. You know, I always said, when I turn 30, everything will end, mm -hmm. basically. And um, I don't know why, but I started to, to, to feel and to believe that um, even when I was 15, 16, I always thought, okay, my 30s birthday needs to be something very special because afterwards it will be, um, everything will be over. Um, now I'm 30. Uh, I just turned 30 <laughs> in last uh, November Happy and birthday. nothing has changed. So it's a bit of uh, disappointment. <laughs> <laughs> um, about that, that feeling you, uh, we've asked you to read something. I think that would be a nice time now. To read. It's okay, uh, yeah. yes. Unfortunately, I can't read it in the nice translation of the book and in, in, in Dutch, but I will have to read it in English if, if that's okay. And this is also a premiere for me. I've never read it out in, in, in English so far, but uh, I hope I will pronounce everything right. Okay, so I read the, the, the abstract. Yes, please. So it's, it's really the beginning of the book. Um, this is the start, the, if you want to say the preface or the, the introduction of it. <coughs> I'm, I am writing this out of fear out of fear of the seamless transition, of not having noticed that I've grown up. No initiation, no final exam. I simply floated into 30, 
Got all the degrees, always showed up on time, smiled a lot, not much crying, cried a little, but mainly smiled. Jumped onto many wagons, took a short ride, then changed direction. I've traveled to distant places, know my way around the world, have spoken with a lot of people, seen a lot of images, heard a lot of voices, stood in the wind here and there. But what really means something to me, what I really believe, I cannot say. Where I want to go, that's much easier. I want to go up and up, the ladder is long. I've never lacked ambition. Even in school, I was the first to class, ready for the teacher to confirm with a nod that I scored the highest grade. When I arrived at university, I told the professors what they wanted to hear. I loved to see their faces light up when I hit the right tone at the right moment, when I referenced the theory they were waiting to hear. I betrayed my heart for them, and in the evening, washing dishes, told myself there would be still time for dissent and I would visit Rome when the weather was nicer. A uh, sympathy junkie, quick to profess things he knows too little about, who dreams of opposition, but in the crucial moment remains silent or half-heartedly searches for common ground. When it gets loud, I cover my ears. When an angry glance cuts in my direction, I look up at the ceiling, the cracks in the paint. I'm afraid of not wanting more than I have. I'm afraid I'll miss the right moment to leap. It's not enough to climb construction fences at night, pouring sand in your shoes and rubbing mud on your coat to give the impression of adventure and real risk to anyone who might visit. A torn jacket sleeve and a hickey on my neck don't make you a hero. It's not worth breaking the law just for short trips beyond the comfort zone. They don't lead into the open. They merely ensure that everything stays as it was before. The fear of failure is nothing but a tick, a way to prepare for defeat. But the fear of compromise is the real barrier. Soon I will only lead conversations that begin with stress and end with so much to do. We'll sit in lunch breaks and dream of sabbaticals and promotions. Before falling asleep, I will think about raises and wonder if there's enough baby food in the fridge. Clouds will drift above my head and I will never look up at them. Stars will fall, and I'll be too tired to make a wish. I'm afraid of prenups in stuffy conference, room, conference rooms, afraid of bank holidays and the first insincere smile, of my free existence coming to an end of a permanent position, retirement funds, spa weekends in May, afraid of the CV, maybe. That's what Worth fighting is that for emotion. The only desire that counts is that for a beating heart. Too much ground has been lost to cynicism. It wraps it co its cold fingers around everything, blows out the last candle, look, locks the last emergency exit, tears down the last curtain. Cynicism is claiming victories on all fronts. And for those of us who fall behind, it's there to tend to our wounds with Nivea creme. It leads us to believe that all we need to catch up is, it, is its help. In reality, though, cynicism is holy, hollowing us, us out, drilling deep into our core, extracting the precious resources that are stored in there. Thank you very much. Um, this fear, this fear of, of, of becoming the person you're describing, where do you think it come from? Mm. Yeah, like I said, I think it, it comes from the, from the not really being at ease with the time um, the protagonist is living in. So this kind of ironic or even cyn 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 cynical, cynical? cynical mm -hmm. times in, in, the, in the way that, you know, he describes in the book, um, it's not about the parents generation, but it's the older brother generation. He's always constantly fighting. So he turns 30 and he is always having fights with the people around 50 who all all pretend that they are still so young and they know everything and they're so cool and they have done all the right decisions. And um, and uh, in, in, in every aspect of life, you know, they, they have done 
the right voting for in political, they have done their, have the right morals, um, they go to the right demonstrations and they eat the right food and everything, they do everything right. And so what is it, mm -hmm. what you as a, as, as, as a growing up person, who can you oppose? You know, mm -hmm. um, this was really out of a, I mean, the situation has changed now, um, at least politically, but this was written maybe three, four years ago where, especially in Germany, there was this constant feeling of, um, you know, everything is all right, everyone is happy, and there's a, a big harmony uh, in, in terms of, you know, we can all lean back and um, enjoy our privacy. Um, and, um, and, and, and especially this older brother generation um, who, who are in power, who have a lot of power um, positions, and they have power, but they pretend to be um, very nice and very like friends, basically, you know. Mm -hmm. And this kind of where's where's the fight? How can I how can I oppose them? And how can I try to make um, my own my own way and not just imitate? I mean, the big fear is probably or where the fear is coming from, just to imitate what everyone else has already done and not to have something individual, your own, basically. And in, in, not so much in the, in the political sense, but in the emotional sense, you know? The fear that you don't have feelings that you, just you feel, feel for the first time, but you just imitate all the feelings who've been there before, basically. Thank you. Um, I think that's also why maybe uh, your book has been described as it was engaged in a controversial revival of romanticism. And then we are going to simplify romanticism and say it's just, is um, uh, uh, very the individual is very present and mm -hmm. it has to be about these real feelings, real emotions. But then they say it's a controversial revival, and that's probably because Germans' relationship with romanticism is complicated. Mm. Why? Well, history. I mean, um, it, it, it has been misused a lot, um, and it's. I mean, it's always more dangerous if you, if you, look at what feeling is and not just raise your soul, the thought or the, the, the mind, basically. Because, Why? Because obviously it's unpredictable. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's unpredictable where feeling leads to and um, what starts as a nice thing can turn out into a, something um, something bad. Um, but this is exactly the thrilling part about emotions. No, you can't control it. I mean, that's so interesting even today. No, I mean, we talk about all the you know, artif um, artificial intelligence and, 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 and the digital modernity and everything, but they're still feeling. And feeling is the only, I would say, next to religion maybe, uh, the only counterpart of our technocratic times. Because, you know, you can design the best possible robot, but it still doesn't have the feeling which human beings have. And so there's this last point um, of, uh, yeah, not being controlled, not, you know, and, and, and this is obviously a good thing. I would always say this is really um, a sign of freedom also to mm -hmm. for human beings, but it also can be misused. And um, and that's obviously happened. And romanticism has a very, very controversial and, 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 and history in, 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 German, um, in German intellectual thought. But I, I was always, I would always argue, yes, that's true. I mean, there was a lot of um, misuse, mis misuse being done, but there's always also a tradition before, for example, the National Socialism, mm -hmm. who used uh, who used the um, the romantic parts, basically. You call it the and original promise. Yeah, the original promise, and I mean, the romanticism as a period um, is around 1800, you know, and um, and it was very, very uh, important in the development of um, a, 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 a liberal civilization, basically, mm -hmm. you know, um, in the terms of that there for the first time, the individual was against the hierarchic um, uh, noble state basically you know and um, and also the idea that um, the universalistic uh, argument has something in common as well with the human being I mean um, the the word Europe um, first and foremost in ger the German tongue was um, was uh, was said by Novalis by a romantic you know he used the word Europe for the first time as an ideal and as a, as a, a moment of uh, you know over the nation over the the small uh, integrity because for the romantics the individual was so big, basically, and, and, and so important mm -hmm. that they didn't want to limit it to a, in, a, a political institution, basically. They wanted to go over this, to have, you know, breaking the borders, but not just the national borders, but the mind borders as well. And did you, uh, originally, when you start writing this book, did, was it your idea also to capture this original problem, a promise? Did it have to be in the book? No? No, for me, it was really, I mean, 
you don't and I be, don't believe it myself when I see the book now, but um, and I can I can I can swear that um, I didn't want to write a book in the beginning. Um, I was really not uh, not sure, and um, the book really um, came to life. Basically, the birth of the book was a very very long one, <laughs> and um, and there was my uh, my um, lector. How do you say my my um, lector? I lector think we can in, go in, with. Who's, who's sitting in the first row. And he is, uh, I always have to say that he is, um, at least 50% of the book is uh, due to him because he really, we, we had a, a very, very intense debate on how to create um, something out of these very undefined feeling I had, you know? And so it wasn't, we, we talked about two years about how, what is the right form, what is the right structure to mm -hmm. get into to this, you know? Because you can be very, very easily um, um, irresponsible with this, you know, in, in, in the sense that, you know, these feelings I just described now, I mean, a lot of people feel it and we all somehow feel it, but it's very easy to, to you know, slip and go into very cliche and, and kitsch uh, way of, of writing and, and probably a lot of a lot of danger is in the book as well to be kitsch and to be too pathetic and stuff. But in the end, um, you know, these seven nights, the structure, uh, which was Originally, the idea came through the movie um, Seven by David Fincher, you know, the, mm -hmm. the horror movie um, where a, a murderer um, in New York is um, murdering seven times um, in the way <laughs> of the old sins, basically. And this was the, the initial idea to, to get this structure, um, to, experience, to really experience uh, an example of sinning in the 21st century, what is what is sinning, what is sinning in the 21st mm -hmm. century? It's not that easy to 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 say, you know, uh, um, you know, jealousy. How, what is jealousy today? Or um, or um, yeah. So it was really, it, it was a very uh, tricky um, search for situations I experienced. But then what I wrote in the book was it's not that much the the describing of what I experienced and what the environment was, but it was really the, the biggest sin was to write then about these feelings, feelings. Uh, what I described in the beginning, but in a, in a certain manner and limited to one night. So there was really the, the exper experiment to write. Um, you j I just said one night and then I had to send the text. And um, yeah, and uh, it took over a year, so it was not seven nights after each other. So I had a little bit of sleep in the, <laughs> in the middle. But, um, but yeah, in the end, this kind of, this, um, th this in, the, the initiative, you know, and the experimental form is, is really half of, um, half of the book. Uh, it's content, but it's also the form, the experiment. Mm. Thank you. I think it would be nice to ask Connie Palmer to join us. Mm -hmm. um, many of you will have read her book, De Wette, uh, her first book, and also her other novels as well, of course. It's, um, she is one of the most influential Dutch authors, and she has been for a long time. Um, this book, De Wette, was incredibly successful, uh, sold more than 400,000 copies. I don't think books I are... Blink. It's <laughs> beautiful. <laughs> yes, <laughs> from, yes. Translated in more than 24 <laughs> languages. Can you tell us, for those who haven't read it, what it's about? Oh, what is it about? Well, it's very easy to talk about this book. It, it's about a woman who, in, during seven days, meets seven men and uh, in those seven years, this, the, those men all give an interpretation of this woman. And it starts with the oldest way of interpreting a character, namely an astrologer. I mean, you think it's, it's, it's a pseudo, uh, how do you say, uh, scientific, and it still is. And, but it's still a way people talk about each other. So you still have the, those women magazines, and you can read, uh, I'm a Sagittarius, so I can read that this will be an awful uh, summer for me. And so I, can, I could better skip it. Well, so the astrologer is a way of uh, talking about a character. And then I go to the epileptic, which is a 17th century way of talking about characters. So tell me what illness you have, and I tell you who you are. And then I go on and go on with the religion, the priest, and, and I end with the most modern way of, of talking about a personality, that is the shrink. <laughs> and in fact, that's the first time that the woman in my book called Marie Denit, she constantly is given 
uh, different names by all those men. And that's for the first time that she grabs her own name and she tells her own story. And the shrink is, in fact, an invisible man. You don't see him. It's a monologue. So that's it. Thank you. <laughs> that's it. Um, you said that your character sells her soul for a story. Yes, of course. This is when the moment you, the, the one, uh, the, 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 the Cipher 7 pops up, you have some Faust thing going on. And of course, um, this Faustian motive is also in Simon's book. Uh, the woman, in fact, she gives herself totally away to those men. They can make her, they can break her. It's, it, she doesn't care. So everything she gives, not for knowledge, which is the real, well, well, for knowledge. Faust does it for to become a great artist, and she does it for a story about herself. Mm. So to be defined, and also for the knowledge, all those seven men all represent a kind of knowledge she wants to, she's hunger for knowledge. So it, it was really my aim to write the first Faustian story, um, well, not in, in, in world literature, but it comes close to mm -hmm. that, it comes close to that. Is there something that you think as a writer you're doing as well, selling your soul? Oh, I sell a lot, but um, no, I don't sell my soul, no. But your soul You sell out of <laughs> other people's soul, that's a fact. Oh. Yes, you're rather a Judas as a writer. Because? Well, you don't sell their souls because you don't owe their souls. But uh, Seslov Milos, who for Christ's sake won the Nobel Prize with it, said that the moment a writer is born in a family, uh, it's done with this family. And that's absolutely true. Um, you really should be scared when someone in your family starts writing. <laughs> you, um, I mean, you, you can't, uh, as a writer, um, be satisfied with a, a, a group that is stick together through secrets, and every group is stick together through secrets and through, through everything that is unsaid, especially a family is uh, glued together by all those unspoken uh, troubles and unspoken anger and unspoken love even. So there's the writer who comes to ruin it all. Um. Yes. Throws it all in the streets. So you, if you let your, your little child, well, be, be aware of... Of if he says one day he writer, wants to yeah. become a writer. Yes. Do you think that's true? And, and this is your debut. Um, do you think there's already things in it where you're selling other people's souls? <laughs> yeah, maybe. Who? Um. <laughs> can't say <laughs> <laughs> no but yeah i mean obviously yeah you use a lot of what you experience and you i mean it's 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 the one thing is to use what you see and what you th and, 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 and and what you hear and but then there's the other thing which i think is even more dangerous to project on people you know and to imagine and to give them a life they would never want to have, basically, no? To 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 have this, um, uh, yeah, this moment of, uh, of of throwing over them this this um, this your own fantasy, basically, and then that makes them, yeah, that makes them something uh, which is only because you, which they're not. Believe, yeah, the which they're not. But I mean, I I've, I thought it's very, I mean, you use the word secret, and this is again. Um, maybe a romantic um, tradition, no, to to accept that literature or even art has to do something with secrets and to 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 experience the um, the potential of uh, the, the the creative potential of accepting that there are secrets 
you said in the family, uh, but also maybe in the world as it, as it is. And literature helps in some sense to get a little bit closer to these secrets. It will never solve the, uh, the big uh, secret questions, but it can help to give a little um, hint maybe what these secrets are. Yes, I think literature is on its best when it's revealing not only secrets, but to discover something. And the discovery of the novel, especially of the novel, is that you make connections that no one else has made. Mm. I mean, you are a little Einstein when you write. I mean, Einstein combined things that were thought not to be combined, space and time. So, and as a, as a, as a writer, you, you, you do a lot of thinking. And that's when you, when you, you try to connect things that are not, mm. that are forgotten by others to be, be connected to together. So and that's the revealing aspect of the novel, the discovery. Why should you write novels if there's nothing to discover? I wouldn't read novels if I couldn't, if it, if it didn't give me the promise of something new, something that, that would, would, would be a discovery for me. And it can be on, on more levels, of course. That's why it's such a rich form of art. It, it can also be a stylistic uh, discovery that, that the style of a novel is so new and so fresh and so wonderful that you are totally grasped by such a new style or, or that, that the subject has is, is been taken up, that it's, it's so revealing. But especially, I mean, the, the connections in the novel are very important. You, your character says in the beginning of your book that writing is also a paradoxical longing. Can you tell me? Yes, you long for the others. And you have to stay home to write. So, in fact, you want to, you want to reach out. And to reach out, you have to hide yourself. You have to go uh, back into your room and, and stay inside. I mean, the moment I, I wrote the book 28 years ago, and it, it wasn't, um, a writer wasn't that, I didn't know that I would have such a glamorous life that I have now. <laughs> I, I mean, I'm... I, I, Okay, I made myself a kind of pop star, but that was I. I had to deal with a lot of uh, of, of television, and uh, and it was very unusual. In fact, we only had Gerard Reeve who was was doing this clownesque. Do you see <laughs> television? <laughs> yes, it starts. <laughs> it starts. Well, so um, in fact, my idea was that I would stay inside and I would send the book out into the world. And the book, of course, is, is that what is representing me, my thoughts, my life, my body. I want, I, I, and I also had a longing to stay inside. And that's what I meant with the paradox, to reach out. In fact, I, 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 it, it, I always said it, it's my marriage with the world, the books, but I want to stay inside. I don't want to be married to all these people who read my books, <laughs> but I want them to love the book and love me and through engage. the book, of course. So, but I hope they won't, won't visit me. <laughs> <laughs> so because that's present in your book as well. It starts with that, with a, with a guy sitting at his desk alone. There's rain, there's candlelight. It's, <laughs> it's lovely, but it's also horribly lonely. Yeah, but I mean, uh, really, I, I, this is the... Uh, the traditional answer, but uh, there's no real writing without loneliness. No, I mean, um, this is really the the beginning of everything and the the unrest you feel inside. No, and the hope. I would I would say so that the book is the hope to find somewhere at some points at some time a friend who reads it and feels in some sense the same way and then gives an answer which will never re reach you maybe as a as the writer but it will give an answer to the book and so for him and um or for her and so the the writing is, a, is such an intimate act no yeah. you, you you write I mean, that's what i always i mean it's very naive but i mean just the the the, the simple act of reading somewhere in a you know 
um, in a bed or even in a subway or whatever, and, and someone has, has the book in his hand, and it's just the book and the reader, mm -hmm. and there's no nothing in between, um, which really is, the, yeah, this is... Um, it seems so different to the to the to the experience you, for example, have in the in the in the internet. No, you never feel really lonely in the internet, or you never feel that you're. It's just you and the internet. <laughs> it's a lot of people there, and it's you on the other side. So it's never, um, it's never the same uh, moment, you know. And um, I mean, I was just say saying a couple of. Uh, I mean, this afternoon I was thinking about big um, experiences I had while reading, and I was thinking back of um, I don't know when I was 16 or even reading. Um, you know, the world famous uh, Catcher in the Ray by Salinger, you know, and this incredible effect this book had mm -hmm. on me um, when I read it. And I thought, okay, this book is just, in this moment, it's only this sentence is for me. No one else has never read it before. I mean, millions of people have read it before, but in this moment, I felt this sentence is for me. And this is... Uh, that's the genius. That's the, the genius. Uh, yeah, that's, the, that's what literature can do, and I think only literature can do. In the in the sense, you I know. agree. Huh? Is it different? Why? So only literature can do a painting can't. No, nah, I, I I don't know. I mean, we heard, <laughs> we listened to the beautiful Beethoven. Obviously, you can also say music has the same moment of, you know, you have the feeling that this melody is in this sense just talking to you, and and you have the feeling um, that uh, it doesn't matter where you come from, and it doesn't matter uh, who you are, basically, you can have your own mo moment of experience of it. That's, that's true. I mean, yeah, maybe we can say that's art. I mean, that is really what differentiates art from everything else, from economy, uh, from politics. There's always the context, uh, the, the most important thing, you know, the context of the recipient and the identity and everything. But art is, I mean, this is the romantic uh, I would say the romantic promise that art can, uh, yeah, can talk to people uh, without uh, looking at their identities, basically. Because in the music, there's some th something so silly. I mean, that you see uh, a thousand people sing together. I did it my way. <laughs> this is absurd. And um, but <laughs> this is like the Monty Python. We're all <laughs> individuals. We're all individual. I'm not. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> yes. So yeah. The, uh, so in in music, it's it's fake, and in literature, it's real. <laughs> <laughs> Some might differ on that, but we're not gonna uh, go into that. What I thought was um, very lovely about both your books is, and also a bit sad because you have these characters. And while reading, I thought, I want that kind of life. That sounds wonderful. It the sounds life of Marie de Niet. Well, the beginning. Of the life of, of <laughs> both. There were moments when I was reading them, I felt like, that's it. That's what we should be doing, all of us. Those these encounters. You want you mm. want some. You want to be working at a bookstore. You want someone to come in, and tell you a lot of things about yourself. It's well. You can still buy <laughs> a horoscope <laughs> and, uh, and ask an astrologer to to come and read your stars. You, you could you can pay for that, and it's amazing. Uh, well <laughs> what it's they all know. true. Yeah. Yes, it's, <laughs> but it's, that it's, would that would not be the same because it wouldn't be so spontaneous. Well, so it's a lo it's you both. You, yeah, yeah. It's no, yeah, it's very sweet that you say. That, that means why should I why should I go against it? You can <laughs> go against it. But I think I'm not alone, and I think that both of you describe a certain... You appeal to a certain longing that I had as a reader. Mm -hmm. Well, the longing is, is of a very young person. I mean, th there's also something tragic about growing up, that there has to be so much... Uh, uh, that, y that you're so dependent on, on good stories about yourself. I mean, that's why I call it the... the drama of dependency that my, my collection of essays is under this uh, published under this title it, it's a drama that that is, is it's a drama of our lives all our lives that we are so dependent on on the others of telling or of making us a good character in their stories and i can tell you people rather tell a bad story about you even if you're a good person, even if you're a saint, <laughs> someone will tell a, a bad story about you, make you a bad character in their story. And, and 
the more famous you get, the more um, the, the more you lose grip on those stories. I mean, if you live in a village, it's small, or in your family, it's small. You can be of influence uh, of, of how they talk about you. You better be good. But the moment you be become famous, and that's why you see it in the stretch, Carrie, Jim Morris, and Amy Winehouse, Elvis Presley, they, it's the, 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 the story, you, you lose grip, you, and you're still dependent. That's why you see how the image of Michael Jackson now is changing because of a different story pops up. And it's totally changing, and it will never be good again. He will never be a good guy again. I hope so. <laughs> Do you want to react? No, I mean it's true. <laughs> if you see, if you see, uh, yeah, the 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 problems of uh, of fame, like you say, it's uh, the Elvis Presley problem. No, when when you when you when you when you just li when you just live to live up to the standards other people put on you, and um, and um, yeah, I mean. Elvis still have, uh, has all the, the beautiful texts and the beautiful <laughs> so songs, but he himself is completely empty. Mm -hmm. And then, and I mean, they, I, I was always talking about Elvis. I mean, I was always so impressed about this last concert he gave. And it was such incredibly sad yeah, to see him singing true. the songs of his you know, youth, and he, co he can't remember the lines. Mm. He can't remember the lines. He stands there for minutes, and he can't remember the lines. People start booing and everything, and he's, it's mm. over, you know? And this is the moment where he's the most famous guy of the, like, the most mm. famous singer in the world. And so, yeah, that's the dialectic of, uh, of becoming someone, maybe, so. Mm. Becoming someone, and, and, and even though these bad stories about you happen, every, so, so many people want to be famous. Yes, that's why I try to tell those those scary stories about being famous. Don't. No, there is some. Of course, there's something very scary about being famous, and there's something uh, uh, you love about it. That, that has to do with um, the paradox I describe in the beginning of my book. You want to be. You want to reach out. You want to be of influence, but. Uh, that's why it's it's rather safe to be a writer. You can stay inside, and your books are the vehicles of the way you try to influence people. And 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 singers like Amy Winehouse of Elvis, they have to do it with their with their body. They are so vulnerable out out there, and um, so yeah. And they also have to be authentic. Um, yes, a that's a, yeah, but you th that's yeah. That's also it's what very you difficult, <laughs> very difficult concept. Authenticity. Everyone wants to be authentic, and no one knows how. No. Everyone wants intimacy, and and if you ask people what it is, they lose it. They can't describe it. Um, but authenticity is the most difficult pe thing. You, you can't rather you can't even talk about it. But you try right. to grasp it, I think, a bit. Yeah, but I mean, obviously, this is just a search for. But uh, in the end, we are all players, no, on the big stage. I mean, that's why why theater is the best metaphor for life. I mean, we are all always, um, we are always someone else. We are always acting, um, and then this is not something I would say. This is not something which we should be afraid of. It's just, you know, we should play the role. The ru the the we should play the role. Um, in a way uh, that we we reflect on this, you know, we should reflect. I, I think, as human beings, that we will never really understand who we are and what is how how does it work and where does it come from, how we feel, you know. When I look at you, why do I think exactly the thought? Because that I look at you, it's, you will never explain it. You will never explain it. That's, I mean, uh, the secret of of, um, of fe feelings and expression. And um, but yeah, so the theater is as is, is a way of describing what is happening um, in the human um, in the human world. Maybe there's a different world, uh, not a human world, but in our world, I think theater really helped. And I mean, when it when it really became um, important, um, it. I mean, it was always important, but when it really became important in the say in the view of the 19th century um, to, to become something like a citizen, basically um, it also helped for th citizens to go to the theater and to 
to see that they don't have to be completely um, authentic, but they can be like actors in the way. It really relaxed at some point to see that this is really possible um, for them, you know, in the in the new freedom they, they gain, basically. So, so yeah, I mean, the... If I'm understanding correctly, it was like you saw someone else having these same emotions and you were more okay about yourself, in a way. Yeah, and just, just the moment of... of, of um, transformations that the transformations are happening you know i mean and this historical moment when you know when when the the old structure the old uh, dependent structure was blown off you know and all of a sudden there was the the feeling that there's no like noblesse and 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 and, and you know hierarchies there but everyone's on the same line basically where we are equal and then so what is the no new identity there and theater helps to 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 make under to make a human being understand that um, there is no su such thing as one identity but there are always different identities and that it's the only interesting thing is the quest to find out, you know, and it's not to to be, but to 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 look for it. Um, so yeah, I, I mean, for me, that's always. I mean, I, that's why I go to the theater mm -hmm. and, and and why I, I love it so much because you can always um, see that, you know, everything could be possible and it could happen the exact opposite way and the different way and there's differences you know we live in a time where we don't really see the beauty of differences anymore i would say you know that that there are for example past periods of the time say romanticism or whatever were really different to our times we want to have everything in the same box basically but there are very 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 um a lot of different boxes um in in history and uh, in mentality and in feeling and this is a, a huge uh, richness a uh, richdom i would say and um we should we should uh, go away from this you know feeling that everything needs to be the same basically you know this is uh, then we end up in uh, the google world <laughs> is this a problem of our time do you think I don't think so much about the problems of our time, uh, at least not in these, uh, I mean, of course, there are problems with the, that the ice is melting, etc., mm -hmm. the climate and <laughs> so on, and that we have Terry Baudet, and there are a lot of people who try, think that he's is good, is something good. So, but I'm not s that much thinking about, n even not even about my time. Um, because, well, and at the same time, I, I do. Um, how shall I explain? You always find something, for instance, um, I wrote the last book, as uh, you said it, or, or uh, I, 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 and this is about Ted Hughes, the poet, mm. who was talking about the, the suicide of his wife and his love for Sylvia Plath, um, who committed suicide. I, said. I analyzed the whole life of Sylvia Plath through the eyes of Ted Hughes as a, as a story, as in fact, as, a, as a, the, the passion, as a Matthias passion, a, a passion, passion story. I don't know how to say it and write in English, but. And that's because we, what, what I can see, say about our culture is that it is still very much the culture of sacrifice. And the sacrifice, of course, came back in a very, very, very awful way through the, the, su the suicide bombers, the, the jihad, uh, young people who were going to the jihad. So we got the sacrifice which and we all grew up with with the concept of sacrifice we grew up with it as if it was something very normal we grew up with the uh, with the buildings and churches and and where there was uh, the cross and, and 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 Christ hanging on the cross and he sacrificed his life and we are going to the Matthias Passion and listen to Bach and Abarmedich and etc so um when I try to analyze my culture, and I'm still very much uh, trying to find out what suicide is, why people, I come to something very universal. That's what why I studied philosophy, and that's the sacrifice culture. But offer. That's mm. that's mm. offer. That's offer. Mm. Mm. Yeah. When you when you when you write, uh, do you have the feeling that you are connected 
to past literature? Yes. I, so when you say you don't think that much about your own time, is it that you have the feeling that you, in the way you write or your, your literature talks to books, for example, from the past? No, I use the books from the past, of course, like you did in, in your book, uh, to clarify things about, mm. uh, about my own time. It's not that I don't think about my own time, but I don't think about it in... in, in I think about it in, in a rather abstract way. Yeah, yeah. But of course, I'm, I'm always... I don't think a novel is interesting when it's not talking to other novels. And so I have a lot to do with... Um, mm. Not especially with your Goethe or Schiller or Fichte or Schlegel. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> well, because I mean, th I think Happy. sometimes this is really. Um, we, we tend to forget that this is so important. Not to, to, to ha literature is not only there to. Um, I don't know to, to to give joy to readers and to 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 have this effect, and then um, someone reads and says, "Oh, that's beautiful." But it also encaptures it captures something and encapsulates something from from a different time, maybe or a different sphere, and it it, 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 it transports. No, it is it, that is why a it is a traditional. Does. This is why it's a tra tradition um, or a cultural. A gift, basically, and um, I mean, there's a saying: No, every book uh, you can you can get every book, and you can find the one sentence why it is why because of why it is uh, written about. You know, there's one sentence in every book. This whole book is written uh, for. Oh, what basically. sentence would that be in your book? The first one. I'm writing this out of fear. I would say. Okay. You know, this is the sentence. So you can you can read that sentence. Yeah, and then it's over. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Yeah. No, but I mean, I think um, yeah. This is the interesting, okay. the interesting double That's life good. books have no, um, th that they're not only there to delectar, to 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 give the, to give joy to readers, but also to transport something. And transport something from the past. Yeah. Yes, I think good books do that. They do more than only amuse or entertain. Or amuse, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> no, 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 that's, that's uh, absolutely fine. Um, both your first books were in a, a coming of age. They're very also focused on uh, the individual. And Simon, I think that's because your book was highly praised, but also uh, criticized because I think this focus on the individual. Mm. Yeah, I don't know if that was really the point of the criticism. Um, I mean, obviously, a lot of the generation question in the beginning, I mean, this is, I mean, this is sure that people will say, no, I don't have anything to do with this kind of uh, feeling which is transported in the book. So the generation label basically provoked, mm -hmm. and rightly so. I mean, I would say this book was not written to get um, just the praise. I mean, I was obviously happy to get um, to get attention, but I mean, I, I also wrote the book to get people against it and to say, no, we are we have a different um, experience. For example, you know, I mean, on readings when I had readings, um, the the interesting conversations were mostly when people came up and said, I don't think that it's me you described. I'm 30, but it's not me, you know? And then we started about what, what does it mean? What, what, is, what is the differences? And, and, um, and, and, and where is the, the, um, the unhappiness coming from with, with how, I, how I describe? And I mean, obviously, um, the way the book is written is a way which is, like I said, it's not on irony. It's not going with the ironic um, um, wave basically it's trying to 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 oppose that even and 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 to get back to this kind of um, sensual sensitive um, uh, ways of using language um, which in some sense uh, are obviously pathos uh, a lot of pathos is in there as well um, and I understand that people even my, my age or even younger people who don't really know, um, um, this world anymore, basically, which I know a lot through um, poems, basically. You know, for me, the book, um, th there's a lot of poetry I read, um, which made me, gave me the, the, um, the confidence, basically, to write in the way I wrote, you know, because always when I didn't, 
um, had the feeling I, sh you know, when I had the feeling I shouldn't write, I should stop. It's, uh, it's not, it's not good. It's pathetic. Then mm -hmm. I, some line of a poet or poetry came into my mind and gave me again a little bit of energy to write in the way I had written before. So um, in this was sense... Was it all romantic poetry? No, no, not at all. I mean, very different. I mean, it, it was... For me, I don't really... Um, I don't really categorize poetry in the literary traditions. For me, it's just, no. you know, what yeah. are the poems you come to, come to your mind? You know, they're completely different times and, and contexts, but um, if they touch you, you know, and then you remember it. Mm -hmm. And um, that's like good pop songs or lyrics, and even in a rap song or whatever. It's, um, it's about this one line which you once felt was written exactly for you in this moment, and then you, and then it can help you to talk and think and feel in a in a certain manner, which is not ironic because the irony always gives something in between the the hyper irony, not the good irony I would say in the romantic sense, but the cynical irony, which will always say no, you can you can have you know it's it's you and there's for example the poem, but there's something in between. In, in the sense, and um, what is the difference? Can you, because I don't really know what is the difference from romantic irony and and cynical irony. The romantic irony, I would say, is um, it's about the individual and the subjectivity, basically. So it's um, it's it's a way of describing y your personal attitude towards the world and 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 giving this um, this this hope of um, in describing, for example, nature. No. Um, in, in, in a way that um, it has, hasn't been done before. So it's really, uh, I would say, it's a sincere uh, approach towards um, the, the environment, in a sense. And the hyper irony or the cynical irony, it's not about you and the world, but it's about protecting you from the world, I would say, you know? It's protecting you um, from, from making, um, making claims or making, uh, making errors, even, mm -hmm. um, while, while describing the world. Um, and it, it, it protects you, uh, 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 this shield of irony protects you from really ge giving something uh, out of you, out of yourself and your soul, and making even, um, yeah, making errors, saying something which maybe is stupid, maybe is not uh, f completely thought through. So, uh, because you don't want this, who wants this? Uh, no one wants to be uh, looked at a little bit, um, you know, f um, from a rational perspective. So, so in a way, I mean. it's 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 trying not to engage. Yeah, it's 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 not it's trying not to engage too much from yourself, but it's always going meeting you know meeting on a on a on a on a on a platform where everything is secure basically. It's <laughs> making know? the compromise. Yeah, it's it's a little bit of making intellect. I mean, it's a, a rational intellectual way of behavior, but it's not really talking straight basically. You know, it's it's uh, it's not coming out of you know unprotected. I think protection is the irony is there for protection, like I said, and um, and we all do it all the time. I mean, and something also relaxing. I mean, uh, I don't, I wouldn't say it's uh, it's uh, it's bad or psychological. Even I mean, psychology loves irony because it protects the human being as well from. I mean, it's so hard to always um, try to say um, uh, you know true things, basically. And what you feel, it's quick. It's, yeah. it's intense. Exactly, it's intense, and and you um, and we're not used to it anymore. No, I mean, um, thank it's, God. It's, yeah, you say thank God. So you you probably you yeah you come from the generation of irony. <laughs> well, yes. Oh, I, I abhor people who, who talk too much about feeling. Mm. Me too. Yeah. Um, I mean, and I think that women are never so romantic. I think ro romanticism is typical male. Mm. No, it, it's it's like uh, I'm provoking you. I'm provoking you. But you also you only saw men on the screen when uh, when it was about you. Yeah. Uh, but you could have you could have good and yeah. But you could have showed Bettina Brentano, for example, Bettina von Arnim. Uh, there are a lot of female romantic. I mean, very Schlegel, the the woman of Friedrich Schlegel was. I mean, the women were very very important for the tradition. I mean, in in, in history oh. for for romanticism. But I mean, it's interesting in that Germany. You say, in Germany, maybe, yeah. But I mean, well, now the, the Shelley, for example, Mary yeah, Shelley. Shelley. Okay, Shelley. But even Frankenstein was against romanticism. In fact, mm. well, that's how I, I analyze it. But no, I don't. I I, um, I say this that I don't like the talking about feeling because I never believe people when they talk about feeling. Mm. Um, 
So I like irony. I like irony as a way of just really, yeah. I believe people who are ironic about, especially about when they talk about feelings. Mm -hmm. You said you studied Derrida a lot, no, in the beginning. Yes, <laughs> yes, and you are That's where it's coming from. <laughs> yes, no, I mean know. no, but I, I, yes, Derrida was uh, very important for me in my study. Mm. It's a very difficult French philosopher. I, I won't advise other people to read him. Um, but he's also uh, a really uh, a, a, a rabbi. He's studying text. He is in, in a very Jewish way. He is studying, studying, studying. What does this word mean? And then writing pages about how you can mm -hmm. move a word around. So I, I loved reading him when I was studying. And I, w I won't read him now anymore. And, uh, but I, I thank God I was young when I read it. Mm -hmm. And um, But I, I understand that you can be anti-deconstruction. Uh, what For me, this has something to. In co I mean, this there's a connection to um, the, the 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 ironic times. Basically, have some obviously were at the height when deconstructivism was uh, very very powerful in universities in the intellectual um, mindset basically. And this, in some sense, has been has, is over now. No, I mean, um, yes, deconstructivism is not anymore um, anything people look. At. I mean, the the talk about the new realism in also in universities and in in in, um, in the way of writing and films and everything is now. Um, I mean, we come back to that this the deconstruct is not solving all of the problems we have, especially not now, where, no. for example, we have a very ironic president of the United States, for example, yeah? right. um, who uses irony a lot to, um, you know, to, to make, their, make clear that he is, he is um, you know, the master of deconstructing reality, if you want to call it like this. Anyway, I mean, this is why it's, you're right. I mean, the problem about feeling is um, that you lie a lot. <laughs> That's true. But I would always say it's, um, although there's, there's the risk of lying and of pretending Pretending, um, for, for I'm not th talking that much about talking, but about trying to write something. You know, it's about writing. Oh, writing and, and, is and, a very and, different. Yeah, yeah, thing. no, that was that was what I'm thing. meaning. And, and uh, yeah, but this is what we talk about, not about the irony yeah. in, in the sense of your writing. And and there's a huge tradition in, in the 80s and the 90s of ironic writing. And now I think um, we come to to an end of this period. And uh, and um, you know. The, the search of, of, of finding some truth is, um, in some sense, the beginning of asking the right questions, I would say. So what happened to your fear, then? Is, are you still very <laughs> scared? And um, of what? Yeah, of losing. Losing. Mm -hmm. That's a real good fear. Uh, yeah, I think it should it's, stay. You should yeah. so stick to that yeah. one. Of losing, of losing, um, in some sense, the interest, curiosity, no, in life, because oh, the older you yeah. get, no, I mean, <laughs> I don't know if I it's can true, talk but about I can that. say, yeah, <laughs> but I, I even have the feeling. I mean, you get into habits and you get into into the conve conventional uh, mm -hmm. mindsets. You've heard a lot of things already, so you start of not listening anymore. You go into the same streets where you always want to go. I mean, this is, you know, you, you start to become a really family. But it's a really nice thing, habits. Is it a nice, is it a I nice thing? I don't know. Of it's course. In a way, it is, for the right? For the human being, yes, he likes habit. It's a habit. But uh, not for a writer. Exactly. And not for getting an interesting, um, an interesting start of asking what the world is looking like and what it should look like. I mean, idealism can't grow out of Habits. habitualization, I would say. Yeah. Um, so yeah, this is losing. This is the real, I mean, this is also the fear in the book. And I still have the feeling that um, every day I lose curiosity about the world. And this, okay. is, uh, and this is something that- What are you going to do about that? R reading, reading. Okay. <laughs> and, um, and trying to, to know that this is the risk of you can older. also try to explain why you lose curiosity. To explain? Yeah, to I mean, this is... To explain it, yes. Yeah, I mean, this is why the book is trying... What the book is trying to do, no? I mean, to, to explain the, 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 the fear of, 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 of losing this, this initial 
interest basically mm -hmm. in 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 the secrets of of, of the world. But uh, wouldn't you say it's true? I mean, these the the fear of conventionalism basically in in your everyday life. No, I don't recognize. That. I, mm. I don't. No, I don't have that. Um, no, because no. Maybe this is why there's heroism, heroism yes. uh, in the title. Yeah. <laughs> because this is a very heroic feeling then, if you don't have the feeling that you lost anything. Of course, I lost a lot, but I, 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 I'm not afraid of, of getting uh, attached to um, habits and that I can't change or that, um, um, no, my life is too bumpy to, to, to get a, a nice, uh, mm. calm flight. Mm or to get used to uh, the life that I'm leading, or to get lazy, I, um, or conventional. I think that's also the motto of your book, in a way. When I fall, I will weep for happiness. I still do. <laughs> yes, it is. Um, yes, there is something it's very scary about living, and I think you should that 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 fear, that basic fear, is a very healthy fear. It's uh, of course it is scary, and um, at falling, I, I write in in uh, the lost first book about losing. First losing weight, then losing my money, losing my papers, losing my books, losing my. Uh, chapeau, not my hat. Mm -hmm. uh, um, uh, and that I was very happy when I lost, when I, when I could lose. Uh, and I still agree with that feeling, though it is uh, even become more scareful now. I gr I'm so grow older, and I've lost people, of course, um, which is the most. Uh, uh, scary and awful thing mm. that can happen to you in your life. But I still, uh, I shall describe it to, to explain this, when I fall I shall weep for happiness, or to explain why losing, even losing people uh, doesn't make me change my mind about falling, is this. When I was very, very young, I think, now let's say, to make myself a genius, seven, eight, um, maybe I was 11, but, uh, and I was in bed, and I was thinking, I was, I had a whole ritual uh, to think, my, first I thought my parents die, then my brothers die, then people around me, my friends die, um, and then I, I had to travel, I had to walk through the woods, and then in the end, I had to do this uh, in huge, mind thing that I, I that I myself would would die and it was I really was it was at, at a very young age and the result of this this thinking and it was very hurtful and 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 I got very very scared and I had to cry and and but the result was that I got very very euphoric feeling about being alive and I got a very deep realization of what a miracle it was that I was lying in my bed and that I had parents and brothers and all those friends and that there were trees and water. And, and this is still the connection that I make between falling and experiencing a, 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 an almost euphoric happiness. <laughs> I, ca I can't add anything to that. <laughs> no. Before I'm, I'm going to go to the, the audience, there's one question also uh, on the uh, sheets that I think we should address, and it's about romanticism and Europe. Um, and it's there, Simon, because you said that um, we should look for a new romantic way to talk about Europe. And I was wondering, is how do feelings fit into this? Well. It's clear that at the moment we need to find new ways of talking about Europe and this community idea, no? I mean, the, the European Union, the EU, the institutional 
um, a mirror of the European idea is cracking. I mean, is it today where um, actually the UK should have left the, left. U the, the European different. Union? They're still there, but not for much longer, um, I fear. <laughs> and, um, and I mean, they can postpone it, but in the end, it's, it's a sign of a huge crisis. I mean, that's what everyone is um, talking about. I mean, we talk maybe a little bit too much about the crisis, because if we talk too much about crisis, then in the end, there is really a crisis. Uh, but I mean, it's clear that my generation um, needs to find new ways of, of, of talking about Europe. The former generations, the older generations, they had a, a clear narrative on Europe, the, no, uh, the peace narrative, the no war uh, narrative. And um, for, for my generation or, or, or younger generations, this is um, too far away and they have never experienced the danger of wars and the danger of um, military conflicts basically so they need they need new uh, yeah new ideas and no new intellectual role models basically to 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 talk about it and to think about it and that's why I think the idea of Europe was a really Romantic idea. I mean, in the romantic circle, in the German romantic circle, I'm not that sure about the um, no, the, we, Dutch, yeah. the Dutch, um, or the Dutch or Norwegian uh, romantic circles. But yeah. Europe, I mean, that was really a key concept of of, of romanticism. Uh, they they founded even um, a paper, a magazine called Europa Schlegel and and and, and Novalis, um, where they where they you know expressed their longing for uh, a transgression and uh, a universal um, community. And the like I said, Novalis used Europa as a dream word for the first time in German language. And, um, and that is, in, okay, what do you do with out of this today? Um, I would say, try to, to, to I mean, the politicians um, and we as citizens of uh, European uh, Union should not only talk about the rational um, uh, technocratic institution questions, but also what does it, what is it beyond this? And the European idea is more than just the taxing questions and the uh, and the migration issues and all of this. It is really um, a key concept of um, of a uh, of an intellectual and culture um, a attitude towards life. No, I mean uh, the 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 European tradition. I would always say are the three big uh, instance of life. It's, um, it's, it's science or philosophy, but science. It's uh, religion, on the other hand, and in the middle it's art. And in, in, in the European lifestyle or the European culture um, is really to combine these three uh, big powers in a very, very interesting and, um, and, 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 and influential way. And um, I think, yeah, in a, in a time where everyone is so much talking about nationalism and nations as a new big a new old concept, we should try to, to get back not only on the political but also on the cultural level to remember um, that Europe is a, is a very, very powerful idea which can talk not only to the mind but again to the souls of, of, of people. And I mean, there are different ways of doing this, you know, there are the big television broadcasters uh, think, uh, European broadcasters think about the series. A, a, a television series, a European television series, where obviously they know about the big impact American series have on uh, younger generations in their mind uh, setting, basically. And they, for long, for a couple of years now, try to do this in Europe as well. So, mm -hmm. um, I don't know, like a homeland story for Europe. Um, this is obviously a way. Uh, but I would say this is, um, this is also a romantic attitude towards the question of how to get these community together. You know, you need a glue um, which, which binds us together, which is not only the talk about um, regulations and, um, and, and tax problems, you know. But then the nation state is also a very romantic idea, is it not? So how, uh, so if people become more romantic, how do you keep them away from I would say, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, um, I mean, there are voices, especially in, 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 in Germany and Austria now, from intellectuals who want to get rid of the nation right away and say, okay, let's overcome the nation concept. I wouldn't, I would say this is um, quite a big thing to do. So, especially as an intellectual, you should always be a little bit careful to ask of these big things. Uh, the nation is obviously a very, very powerful concept as well, but I would say, I mean, you can have both, you know, you have, you, you, you can have the national, you will never lose the national um, feeling through your language and all of this, but you can, you can uh, steer in, the, in, in, in people's hearts and minds the longing of something bigger than the, the nation. The nation you have right away, when you're born, you have a language, yes, you have a nation. 
but you shouldn't stop there, you know? And, 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 and because the, the, I mean, the, the, the romantics explained it like this. They said the human beings are so big because they can feel. Mm -hmm. their, their greatness is because they can feel. They're bigger than the nation. They have the nation as, um, you know, the, the key concept, but it's so great that they can, they're so big that they can imagine something bigger. I mean, for them, really, Europe was an unimaginable ideal for us. It's there, it's real, it's and we, it's real, but we, we, we fear to lose it. That's the, that's the moment of time now. We, for us, it's so normal and common that we can't really preserve it. We can't really, um, we can't really protect it and defend it because it's so normal and real, and we only have heard all the time the economic and political arguments. And that's why I think we need to get also, um, again, the um, the the idealistic uh, arguments back into the into the field basically into the playing ground, and we need art for that. Yeah, I mean, without art, there's we no we hope. We need Simon, <laughs> Simon Strauss for that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> no, I mean, we uh, need young people for that. I mean, uh, you say we're afraid to lose it, but I don't think even that Europe isn't isn't not not is not yet a concept. Uh, we can't lose it because we don't have it. I mean, they try to create U Europe by by a, a, an economic rule, by the euro, by the money, and you can't create a nation. You can't create Europe through money. So that was a huge mistake. And I think you're absolutely right that it has to be done in other ways and in more, much more... Uh, idealistic ways, but uh, I, I really hope I'm too old for that. Mm -hmm. So I leave it to you. Yeah. I think you I think we you will can do be it. needed. Both of us will be needed at, 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 the, at, at exactly this, because when you say idealistic or when we use the word idealistic, a lot of people right away think, ah, oh, that's naive. Idealism is naive, but that's no, not true. No, it's not uh, naive when you use it in, in, in the philosophical sense. Yeah, exactly. That it's about an idea. Exactly. You can connect people through an idea. Exactly. But uh, the way politicians use the word idealistic, yeah. and that's, that's the start hmm. of the era, I would say. Exactly, that's the point. Yes. And, uh, um, and yeah, and art and artists and intellectuals, I think, could be much more powerful if they wouldn't try to imitate politicians. If they wouldn't try to say the same things as politicians say, just in their ways, you know. But they should really offer something different. And, um, and yeah, I, I, I think there's big, big um, possibilities to, to do different ways of talking about it. We just have to really concentrate on this issue to find a new, uh, a new language and a new um, power structure, basically, of, uh, of keeping this idea. You say it's not there yet even better, then we can build it. <laughs> and um, yeah, but, but it's a, like you say, it's a, it's, it, it can't be done, especially now with economy, economy alone. No, you know? they've tried it. We, 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 yeah, failure. I mean, the euro obviously is just the last stone on it. It was founded much earlier, uh, but also obviously out of economic uh, uh, reasons. But the concept of Europe, Europa, it's not mm. just the EU, it's bigger than the I mean, the, that was really an intellectual and idealistic concept. And uh, maybe sometimes it's good to go back to where it comes from to, f to understand where, where the future could be. Maybe. Yeah. Are there any questions? Okay, I, I, someone told me recently that I have to do this in another way. Because I was going <laughs> to ask you, I want you to give me three questions. And then s somehow there's always three. I can't three questions. You, talk, you talked about identity, and maybe the whole evening was about identity. Uh, and you talked about how you exploit your material, your environment, your friends, maybe, uh, in your books. Um, and there's maybe another side of it, or the back side of it, is that the, the material itself is working with you, because it maybe is trying to be part of a story that is not yet written. And I w I'm just curious to ask you if you, biographic, biographically or just by the idea, if you can, if you can connect to the idea that, that persons uh, and situations are in a way posing for you because you are the writer and you are, you are building the story. I think this is a question for Simon. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, I didn't pay enough attention to 
give an answer. Um, I, I really don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm so, so sorry. I really don't know what you asked. Can you rephrase? I hope you Sh paid it. Shall I rephrase, or do you? Yeah. If you want to say Re it again. I mean, I think I understood what yeah, you maybe mean. You but <laughs> the question is, I, I mean, that's how I understood you. As a writer, are you the... Do you have, as a writer, the power about the material, or does the material also have the oh, power about okay. you? Yeah, okay, now sense. I can be very short on that. I have the power. <laughs> I'm the only one. The material. I mean, you have writers who say that, that, that you start writing, and then s suddenly the, the, the character starts talking to you. It never happened to me. <laughs> Yeah. I think it only happens to bad writers. I'm sorry, it happened to you? <laughs> no. Yeah, um, maybe did. I'm a bad writer. I'm, start <laughs> no, I'm just no, starting. No, no, no. <laughs> no but um, I mean, as an historian, it's an interesting question about, as an historian, as an, as an academic, I mean, there, the, the, the question he, he raises is obviously a fundamental one. Is there something, as um, in German it's saying, veto recht der Quelle? Die Quelle, the source, has a right to veto and an argument. Okay, but that's that's the historical. That's the historical academic way. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, but then I understand that. Yes. Yeah, but obviously we talk about literature, not in, about science. Hope uh, gladly. But um, I mean, is there is there s something? I think you used the word. There's a situation which pauses, so you can describe it. Yeah, I mean. This is obviously a religion question, no? <laughs> a religious question in some sense. Do you have the feeling that there's, there's um, coincidence, for example? Oh, of course, yes. You know, that something happens and you feel this happened just for me so I can write about it. Oh, oh no. No, then I definitely no. So you're ha completely constructive, so everything, it's you. I mean, you give the... No, but it's kind of magic thinking that you think mm -hmm. this happened to me so I can write yeah. about it. That, that, and um, I know what magic thinking is. Uh, I know, and I'm, I mean, if you are mourning uh, great losses, then the only thing you have is magic thinking. Mm. So, um, But I don't think that things happen to mm. me so I can write about it, no. Mm. Yeah, you're probably right. I don't, I don't. I don't know yet. <laughs> no, you're still young. No. <laughs> forever young. For, not forever, I can tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> Is there a second question? Yes. <laughs> Yeah, or it's yes, and then we'll, we'll translate, I translate along the way. Translate it to. Vooral gericht naar mevrouw Palme. Toen ik de jonge man, sorry. Dat is ook vooral de vraag is gericht naar u. Oké. Nee, toen ik hier kwam en ik heb de brochure gezien, de vraag en ook kan romanticisme of al Europe something. Mijn antwoord meteen was nee, omdat romanticisme vooral vanuit de individuele persoon, vanuit de lyrische hoe je de realiteit ervaart. En de Europa is meer de uh, eenwording, het geheel. Hoe kan die twee zich dat verhouden? En ik was wel benieuwd of u ook hoe daarover denkt, of u mee eens bent dat het romantiek heeft niks te bieden voor de Europa. Um, yeah, sorry, Simon, that is it's meant for me. No, I, th I think you're right that you, uh, ik denk dat je gelijk hebt dat ik, um, helemaal niet uh, geschikt ben om over Europa te denken, na te denken. Ik geloof ook niet dat een stroming als uh, rom de romantiek, uh, die wij eigenlijk in Nederland nauwelijks kennen, uh, daarmee heet dat grote beroemde boek van Rudiger Zafranski ook uh, romantiek aan de Duitse affaire. Mm. Het, wij weten ons nauwelijks raad met romantiek. Vandaar dat het bij ons heel gauw vernauwd wordt tot uh, praat over gevoelens of hartstochten of pathos. Of... En daar kom je in Europa helemaal geen uh, kant, daar kun je geen kant mee op. Dus ik, ik denk, als ik u goed begrepen heb dat u gelijk heeft. <laughs> Vindt u dat niet fijn? <laughs> Simon, can I ask you as well? So, Romanticism is very much focused on the individual when in Europe we need a community. 
Is that not a paradox? Simon? Yeah. Ah, sorry. Yes. I, I didn't get what the discussion was about no, before. If I was it about you, also that it's a very German concept, romanticism? Also, and that, that, also that, but that, that we need also, you also said that you need a, a community in Europe and that romanticism is so focused on the individual. Is that not a... No, I don't no? think so. I mean, Why obviously not? it's about, uh, it's a community out of individuals, so it's perfect for Europe. In the, in the romanticism, I mean, what was their big aim? To do Vereine, to do, f uh, uh, to found, like I said, a, a newspaper or a, a magazine um, together, you know? I mean, they were also having all these salons, when I said before, the, the women who were so important there and who actually um, um, triggered um, um, the, romantic, the romantic as a period, they always lift through community and to, to, to interaction. I mean, they were the first coffee house, coffee house uh, intellectuals, basically, the, rom the romantics. No, 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 it's, it's not about, um, it's not at all um, the classicist idea, ideal, this lonely wolf uh, um, ha happening. No, no, romanticism is completely attached to the idea of um, 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 community or, or um, Vergesellschaftung, wie sagt man, uh, uh, coming together in a society, basically, but uh, but not in in the in the in the technocratic sense, but again through the ideas. But the debates um, they had were always happening in contexts of interaction. Um, and I mean the big the big network. They were the first networkers. No, I mean. Lord Byron, who did he all knew in the whole of Europe? You know, he translated so many, uh, uh, so many uh, different literature. I mean, they were really uh, um, influencers, you would say today, um, in, in in some sense. But I mean, I would be interested the romantic, or maybe I didn't understood what you said. But is there really no tradition in uh, in Dutch uh, intellectual thinking? No romantic tradition? No, because hardly. Nicolaus. Beats, for example, I, I, I found. Thank God he's in, forgotten. In Bilder Dijk? <laughs> yeah? Well. Bilder Dijk? Bilder Dijk. Completely no. Uh, no Rather uh, terribly boring. Yeah? Okay. Yeah. And, in, and they don't have a position in, 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 in the intellectual tradition? No, absolutely not. Mm -hmm. They are. Uh, Forgotten and it's uh, well no no they were, they were very very boring and uh, it, it, we don't have a tradition of oh, because fun. that's different for example in Norway no I mean they, they have the tradition the, the romantic tradition the, like okay when. sorry another question over here yeah um, well it's actually to Connie because you were uh, talking about it earlier. Um, I think we are all people and we all have thoughts, but we also all have feelings. And I was wondering why why we shouldn't believe people who have feelings. Or who no, no, I'm sorry. I, I believe people. Of course I believe people who have feelings. But um, there's something in the talking about feelings or in, 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 in the concept of, of authenticity, for instance, that when... That, that people think that they are real and authentic, and when they uh, when they speak out, uh, when they say, "Well, I, when they come to your party and they 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 are grumpy and they spoil your party because they're so honest," that's that's what I hate about people, honest people, and and people who say, well, I don't feel well, so why should I amuse myself? So that's, there's something, when feeling is connected to honesty and authenticity, that, that I don't like about it, because they spoil your party. But that's probably more the problem of parties in general, no? <laughs> they, they're always yes. people spoil it. <laughs> yes. So I don't, of course, I, uh, people have feelings, and I write about feelings, and it's... Um, but it's very hard to talk and to listen to someone who's talking. The mental uh, 
problems. I would say these, the, the identity fixed uh, time is really um, also a problem. In this sense, I would say you're right that there's too much talk about you know, hmm. who are all the people who feel uh, left behind, for example. You know, a, a, a problematic thing, but in Germany we have always this, we need to be, um, we need to pay attention and we need to accept that so many people fell, feel left behind, you know. That's why they all vote for the, for the AfD, for the right uh, national, um, right radical mm. parties. And so in, this, in, in the political context, I would say it's a problem if you only make an argument out of feeling. Now, I feel this, so this is al already an argument, you know. But we don't talk about only politics, kind of, but we yeah. talk about the, the, the importance of feeling and literature. Um, and and, and that's, why I, that's why I wanted to protect a little bit the, the feeling uh, against the rush. I know. <laughs> I think we have room for one more question. Yes? Thank you. Oh. I had a question for Simon. Um, you spoke before about irony. I and can't see you, but <laughs> I hear you. <laughs> about irony and how it protects us from all criticism. And to create like a counter movement to that, you would need um, incredible vulnerability. Um, and I think as a writer, you um, needed to have that to write the book. But how can you see that like in a bigger uh, counter movement for uh, the time we live in and um, the way it makes people feel and think about themselves? Very interesting question, I would say. I mean, I ask myself the question a lot. Um, how is how, you used exactly the right word, vulnerability, um, and in, 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 in the sense that you know we all have to accept that there are things happening in our lives which will harm us a lot. I mean, you talked about death. Obviously, this is the biggest moment of feeling that you, as a human being. Uh, can't protect yourself from the outside there really something happens which you never will uh, be um, um, ready for and you will never be protected enough through any form of irony no I mean this is really the end of irony the death moment um, I always said that writing for example texts um, Nachrufe how do you say Nachrufe um, Nachrufe uh, Obituaries is Obituary. the la in the world of complete hyper ironic this is the last escape moment where no one will write an ironic text when there's a death and you write about it no anyway so i would say that um maybe the it is really the, the well then you didn't see that monty python speech of uh, john cleese mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah maybe but maybe it wasn't then it's ultimate huh? funny. His, his i wish i hope and I, I died that someone makes people laugh, laugh. to death. Yeah, 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 yeah. You always church, laugh. You always church. hope that other people do it. But you yourself on a funeral make laughs? I, w I would, I would, it would be great if I could. Yeah, exactly. But it's hard, no? I no, mean, it's, it's very it's hard. Very hard. Really have anyway, I mean, we don't talk about death. <laughs> <laughs> That's the last thing we, we shouldn't probably talk That's about. But, <laughs> but I wanted to, yeah, I wanted to just stress your question. I mean, I don't have an answer to it. But I think really the, the counter movement I'm dreaming of is um, that the intellectual or the the emotional counter movement is really to let this happen even in other contexts. So, um, you know, the, the, the moment of, um, I always, you know, iconic moments of film history, for example, for me, and in general, is um, Rebel Without a Course. The first, uh, the first scene, you see James Dean, this idol, this heroic idol, crying. That was the first mm. moment in the history of film where a man you know, there's always Marlon Brando guys and John Waynes and so, and you see a, 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 a heroic figure crying, a man crying. And, um, and that was, uh, I mean, just psychologically so important for a generation of um, whatever, like mm. a, a, a masculinity men who always uh, were trained to be, you know, um, stick and stones may break your bones, but words will never ha hurt you. Uh, these kind of um, uh, tradition. And no, I mean, we, we tend to now think this is uh, incredibly um, easy, you know, to, say, to, to show um, uh, a young man crying in cinema, but at that time it was really, uh, it was really new and um, so it's a good example yeah and this is really the example i would say i mean uh, this this is um we should we shouldn't you know fear 
we shouldn't fear the emotional outputs of what we what, what we have, and we and, and art is the best example. I mean, it's it's uh, it's easier to experience emotions in a in a in a cinema or in a um, in a concert than on the on, on Wall Street. That's for sure. I mean, that's uh, and that's probably part of the problem. I mean, I sometimes think that uh, all these banking crisis and political crisis and everything. I mean, if people would have in every day of their life, just 15 minutes of reading poetry or watching some some part of art and, you know, expose themselves to this moment of uh, emotional uh, unrest, um, then sometimes maybe they would uh, take other decisions and not vote for a Twitterer. Thank you. I'd like to close on that and the notion that we need another crying James Dean. Mm. Yeah, would, there's uh, one, Ryan Gosling. I mean, he's the ah. new uh, kind of figure of uh, a male actor, no? Who, who, who's not in this sense. I mean, he combines the two things. He, he's a very physical actor, but he also, you know, if you remember the, his films, he's not, uh, he's not Arnold Schwarzenegger, no? Yeah, that's <laughs> he has true. This. Okay. Um, thank you very much for being here. You're allowed to go to the bar, but... Mm -hmm. uh, Jochem is going to play for us uh, mm. again, um, and oh, I think that <laughs> you can either leave, but you can also stay and listen. It's whatever you oh, want. No, stay. So, Simon Strauss, Connie Palme, thank you very, very much. Thank you, thank you, much you for your um, Thank you. Thank you.